Hey everybody, welcome. welcome to Super Simple. I'm Mark Tier, the founder of Black Spectacles, and today we're very lucky to have Heath May from HKS join us. Um, we did a uh, sort of a little bit of a preview a couple of days ago, and trust me, you guys are in for an awesome project. Uh, some of the things these guys are doing are really at the uh, the bleeding edge of what's possible in architecture. So this is going to be a really awesome one. Um, if you don't know Heath, uh, he's a director of HKS Laboratory for Intensive Exploration. He's an architect with 12 years of professional experience, including commercial, hospitality, sports, and healthcare. He's currently focused on R&D and the application uh, of this research to the built environment. Uh, he has an avid interest in, in passive solar design, uh, which encourages a uh, current line of research initiative into the potential for using software for dynamic solar design. Um, in addition to R&D, Heath leads a design team responsible for projects including Future GSA, uh, which is a net zero renovation solution that earned the 2012 WAN uh, Commercial Building of the Year Award. And he worked as a senior designer on sustainable urban living, uh, which was a winner of the 2010 Chicago Athenaeum uh, Green Good Design Award. Uh, in April of 2013, he was named a recipient of the Building Design and Constructions 40 Under 40. Way to go, uh, Heath. Um, and he currently serves on the advisory board of the PAC CAR Technology Institute at the University of North Texas and holds a position on the executive committee of the HKS Global Design Council. So that's a little bit about Heath. Uh, before we get started, if you'd like to register for our next episode of Super Simple, you can go to blackspectacles.com slash podcast to register to attend. Um, and today, you guys know that we have design software tutorials taught by world-class architects like Heath um, on blackspectacles.com. So make sure you stick around until the end of the episode because we have a special Black Spectacles promo code to share. Uh, so stay tuned to hear about that at the end. And then today we'll be taking questions using the GoToWebinar question box as well as on Twitter using the Super, using the super Simple Podcast hashtag. Um, so yeah, so to get started, again, thank you, Heath, for sharing your work with us. Can you tell us a little bit about the LA, LA Rams project? Thanks, Mark. Yeah, so what we have here, we have a 70,000 seats uh, NFL stadium. Uh, it's part of about 300 acres of uh, urban redevelopment uh, in Inglewood, California. It's just east of LAX. Roughly 11 acres of open plaza that will be covered by an aluminum skin. Uh, and a 6,000 seat performing arts venue also underneath that, uh, that aluminum skin. So uh, the, the premise of the, of the project, uh, really large uh, redevelopment uh, just east of LAX airport in LA. You know, the, the, the thing I want to mention first is that uh, this is very much a work in progress. And as you can imagine with a, with a project of this, uh, the scope and complexity, uh, it's a very highly orchestrated team. And so, you know, I, I want to uh, particularly thank Walter P. Moore Engineers, uh, Zayner Metals, and Studio NYL uh, as being, you know, really key players and part of the process with our sports and entertainment mm -hmm. studio along with Line here at the office. So this is it, right? That is it. Uh, so uh, here we have here, uh, you know, just an aerial kind of uh, to, to get your bearings a bit. Uh, so the the roof that you see here um, is covering uh, not only the, the NFL stadium itself, but that 6,000 square foot performance venue and a really large uh, area of public plaza. Um, and it's important to understand that this is an open air stadium. So while we have some protection from the elements, um, it's not going to be enclosed and air conditioned in the traditional sense. Okay. So uh, we can go to the next slide here. Uh, before we get into exactly what we're doing, I thought it would be helpful to understand kind of why and how we approach this project. And mm -hmm. um, we use technology early in the process to really kind of understand uh, the climate of the location. And we dig really deep into this. And so this is kind of a page from a, what we call a design brief that we created really early on in the project uh, to start to understand what the climate was like, um, not just generically in Southern California, but specifically in this site. So we'll go to the next page. Okay. And here we can see the uh, the the outline of the the available uh, acreage that we're that we're looking at here, and you can see LAX kind of in the in the lower left of this page. Um, so we can understand that it's going to be highly visible um, from a flight pattern as you fly into LAX. You're going to come right over the top of the stadium. Um, that uh, that was a constraint and a criteria that we had to think about, not only keeping the uh, the stadium low enough uh, for the uh, flight patterns, but also thinking about during the construction and the erection process how we make sure to keep the cranes and the other equipment um, within the FAA guidelines. Okay. 
Uh, so early on, uh, what we like to do is look very specifically at a few things, and uh, those those things uh, are or include the dry bulb temperature, relative humidity, the wind, and the solar radiation. And by understanding these things, and not only how they how they work or operate in isolation, but more importantly how they operate um, together within a system, we can start to really kind of take advantage of this Southern California climate, and we can use uh, strategies to develop uh, to allow us to use kind of the natural, uh, the natural temperature swings, the natural humidity swings, and the breezes to make this a very comfortable place for people without having to use a lot of, uh, of HVAC. Okay. Okay. So kind of. Uh, Walking through this a bit, one thing that was uh, was important as we started to to analyze the site is understanding that uh, this particular location was really right on the boundary between two different climate zones, um, and we'll kind of understand why this is important as we move through these slides. So we go to the next one. Uh, uh, we can see that we're we're right uh, right on the edge of California climate zone six and California climate zone eight, um, and so. We're really getting a bit of the, uh, the 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 more Mediterranean climate that we see along the coast, along with some of the climate um, that's a bit different further inland. And we have to kind of take both of these things into account because uh, understanding these allows us to develop the the right strategies to to create kind of this open air environment that will be comfortable. Okay. So next slide. Um, this is just the Köppen Geiger climate classification system. Um, it's uh, one of the uh, the primary ways to classify climates, and just kind of understanding there, you see um, the two different climate classifications and kind of how we straddle the the boundary between the two. And then in the next slide, we're looking at some prism climate data. Um, these are 30-year normal patterns, so that we can start to kind of understand the annual precipitation. Um, that's that's part of what we're studying, along with uh, with a lot of other climates. We we look at uh, typical meteorological year, TMY3 files. Um, and what we started to do is actually uh, use some, some other services that project the climate into the future, because we know that we live in a time of, of really rapid and remarkable climate change. Mm -hmm. And if we're designing based on what's happened over the past 30 years, we're really kind of starting out uh, behind. So we've started to project that climate data as well. Okay. Um, and then just a few uh, few images of uh, things that we're using. These are coming out of Ecotect. You know, it's a very readily available software, um, very powerful if you know what to what to use to uh, to generate the information and how to uh, how to understand the information that's coming out of it. So here we're looking at the uh, the dry bulb temperature um, through the year and through the day. Okay. And the next slide will help us understand a bit about the prevailing winds, and we're really interested in not only what direction they're coming from and what the magnitude of that wind is, but the content of, of the wind itself. And so what is the temperature? What is the humidity? And if we can understand these things, we can really start to synthesize a lot of these, uh, these different uh, climatic variables to help us with our strategies. Okay. Um, so psychrometric charts, and so uh, so most architecture students see these at some point in their in their education, uh, but essentially we're looking at temperature and humidity, and we're plotting all the points during the year and kind of understanding what uh, is the climate like in this zone relative to uh, what a what a person in North America might feel comfortable. So that kind of darker blue area, um, that indicates kind of the zone of human comfort, at least within the culture of, of where we live. And we can see that a lot of the points during the year are uh, at a lower temperature than what we're usually comfortable. So we kind of have to understand that we need to employ strategies that allow us to expand that range of human comfort, uh, both both directions. Um, so you can see here, um, thermal mass effect is, is something that we can use where we can uh, we can retain some heat and we can release it later in the night when we get a diurnal swing, uh, so we can bring the temperature up and have it be a, a little more stable. Okay. Uh, next slide. Um, and it's just important here to show two of these because throughout this process of studying and analyzing the site, uh, we had to pull data from two different uh, airports. Uh, we needed to get one that was in both climate regions, and what we found was that data was um, similar, but there were enough differences that it made it very important for us to look at both sets of data and do some analytics between. Okay. Okay. And the next couple of slides uh, show how we start to look at the uh, LA Basin ecology and start to understand um, what are the natural features and the, the different variations in uh, local flora and fauna. Um, these things can often be overlooked when we're designing a project because uh, many times an architect has a tendency to jump straight into design without really understanding what's available. Um, if we go to the next slide, we can start to see 
where our project sits, uh, that little yellow indicator in the lower right, um, and then we can look at some of the different uh, environmental regions that are kind of around and surrounding LA, and we can understand that uh, there's the chaparral region that's uh, really quite, uh, quite intense in terms of the wildlife, uh, both with plants and animals. And in the next slide, uh, something that we've started to do is we really try to take an inventory of, uh, of all the, uh, the native plant species. And what this allows us to do is kind of understand going in um, what would be appropriate to use here and how can we use this for things, uh, something other than just uh, thinking about it as a static landscape, but we can kind of take advantage of the evapotransport these different plants and understand how if we can drag a breeze across a certain species that might help to cool the air or provide a different humidity level.